So this time I thought I'd kind of point it at me. It's probably like way too close to be able to see me good, but that's probably a better thing for you guys and better for the camera so that I don't break it. But anyway, today we've got Jim Butcher's Proven Guilty. Don't know. Hopefully you were able to read that. Anyway, what we're on today is chapter 8. Ouch, my foot got stuck. Anyway, what we're on today is we are on chapter 8 of the Dresden Files, Proven Guilty. If you've missed those previous chapters or even the previous books, do look in their respective playlists below and go ahead and grab your copy of Proven Guilty out. Let's read along together and let's also make sure to hopefully like, subscribe, and share this content with others. Here's chapter 8. The cabbie drove me to the 18th district of the CPD on Larrabee. The neighborhood around it was, has seen a couple of better days and a thousand worse ones. The once infamous Cabarini Green isn't far away, but urban renewal and the efforts of local neighborhood watches, community groups, church congregations from several faiths and cooperations with the local police department had changed some of Chicago's nastier streets into something resembling actual civilization. The nest nasty hadn't left the city, of course, but it had been driven away from what had once been a stronghold of decency and despair. What was left behind wasn't the prettiest section of town, but it bore the quiet, steady signs of a place that had been a passing acquaintance with law and order. Of course, the cynical would point out that Cabernet Green was only a short walk from the Gold Coast, one of the richest areas of the city, and that it was no coincidence that funds had been sent that way by the powers that be through various municipal programs. The cynical would be right, but it didn't change the fact that the people of the area had worked and fought to reclaim their homes from fear, crime, and chaos. On a good day, the neighborhood made you feel like there was hope for us, as a species, that we could drive back the darkness with enough will and faith to help. That kind of thinking had taken a whole new dimension for me in the past year or two. The police station wasn't new, but it was free of graffiti, litter, and shady characters of any kind. At least until I showed up. In jeans and a red t-shirt, bruised and unshaven. I got a weird look from the cabbie who probably didn't get all that many sandalwood scented fares to drop off there. Mouse presented his head to the cabbie while I paid through the driver's window and got a smile and a polite scratching of the ears in reply. Mouse has better people skills than me. I turned to walk up to the station, stubbornly putting my money back in my wallet with my stiff left hand as I walked, and Mouse walked beside me. The hair on the back of my neck suddenly crawled and I looked up at the reflection in the glass doors as I approached them. A car had pulled up on the far side of the street behind me and was stopped directly under a no parking sign. I saw a vague shadow inside the car, a white sedan I didn't recognize, and which certainly wasn't the dark gray car that had run me off the road earlier. But my instincts told me I was being tailed by someone. You don't park illegally like that in front of a police station, no less, just because you're bored. Mouse let out a low rumble of a growl, which made me grow a shade more weary. Mouse rarely made noise at all. When he did, I had begun to think it was because there was some kind of dark presence around. Evil magic, hungry vampires, and deadly necromancers had all earned snarls of warning but he never made a peep while the mailman came by. So, adding it up, someone from the nasty end of my side of the supernatural street 
was following me around town. Good grief. At least I usually know who I'm pissing off and why. By the time the investigation gets to the point where I'm being followed, there's usually been at least one crime scene and maybe even a corpse or two. Mouse growled another warning. I see him, I told Mouse quietly. Easy, just keep walking. He fell silent again, and we were never broke stride up to the door. Molly Carpenter appeared and opened the door for us. The last time I'd seen Molly, she'd been an awkward adolescent. All skinny legs, bright-eyed interest, and hesitation of movement offset by an appealing personal confidence and frequent smiles and laughter. But that had been years ago. Since then, Molly had gotten all growed up. She strongly favored her mother, Charity. Both of them were tall for women, only an inch or two under six feet. Both of them blonde, fair, blue-eyed, and both of them built like a proverbial brick house, somehow managing to combine strength, strength, grace, and beauty that showed as much in their bearing, expression, and movement as it did in their appearance. Charity was a rose wrought of stainless steel. Molly could have been her younger self. Of course, I doubted Charity had ever worn an outfit like Molly's. Molly stood facing me in a long, gauzy black shirt, shredded artistically in several places. She wore fishnet tights beneath it, showing more leg and hip than any mother would prefer. The tights, too, were artfully torn in patches to display pale, smooth skin of thigh and calf. She had an army surplus combat boots on her feet, laced up with neon pink and blue laces. She wore a tight tank top, its fabric white, thin, and strained by the curves of her breasts, and a short black bolero, bolero jacket bearing a huge gaudy button printed with the logo SPLATTERCON in dripping red letters. Black leather gloves covered her hands. But wait! That's not all. Her blonde hair had been dyed, party-colored, one half of her head bubblegum pink, the other sky blue, and it had been cut at a uniform length that ended just below her chin and left most of her face covered by a close veil of her hair. She wore a lot of makeup, way too much eyeliner and mascara. A black lipstick colored her mouth, Bright rings of gold gleamed in both nostrils, her lower lip and her right eyebrow, and there was a bead of gold in that little dent just under her lip. There were miniature barbell-shaped bulges at the tips of her breasts, where the thin fabric emphasized rather than concealed them. I didn't want to know what else had been pierced. I know I didn't because I told myself that very sternly. I didn't want to know, even if it was, hell, a little intriguing. But wait, that's still not all. She had a tattoo on the left side of her neck in the shape of a slithering serpent, and I could see the barbs and curves of some kind of tribal design flickering out of the neckline of her tank top. Another design, whirling loops and spirals, covered the back of her right hand and vanished up under the sleeve of her jacket. She watched me with one eyebrow arched, waiting for me to react. Her posture and expression both made the effort to say that she was way too cool to care that what I thought. But I could practically taste the uncertainty she was working to hide and her anxiety. Long time no see, I said finally. Hello, Harry, she replied. The words came out a little thick, and I saw more gold flash near the tip of her tongue. Of course. It's odd, I said. From here, it doesn't look like you're in jail at all. I know, she said. She managed to keep her voice mostly steady, but her face and throat colored pink in a guilty flush. She shifted her weight restlessly, 
and an odd clicking sound came from her mouth. Good grief. She'd picked up a tick of rattling her tongue piercing against her teeth when she was nervous. Um, I should apologize, I guess. Uh, she floundered. I let her. A long silence made her look more flustered. But I had no intention of politely helping her out of it. Mouse sat down between me and Molly, watching her intently. Molly smiled at the dog and reached down to pet him. Mounts tensed up, and a low rumbling came from his chest. Molly moved her hand toward him again, and my dog's chest suddenly rumbled with a deep and warning growl. The last time Mouse had growled at anything, for that matter, made much noise at all. It had been a crazed sorcerer who made fair headway toward eviscerating me and summoned a twenty-foot-long demon cobra to kill my dog. Mouse killed it instead. Then, at my command, Mouse killed the sorcerer, too. And now he was growling at Molly. Be polite, I told him firmly. She's a friend. Mouse gave me a look and then fell quiet again. He sat calmly as Ma Molly let him sniff her hand and scratch at his ears. But he was wary body language hadn't changed. When did you get a dog? Molly asked. Mouse was spooked, though not the way he was when serious bad guys were around. Interesting. I kept my tone neutral a couple of years ago. His name is Mouse. What breed is he? He's a West Highland Dogosaurus, I said. He's huge. I said nothing. And the girl floundered some more. I'm sorry, she said finally. I lied to you to get you to come down here. Really? She grimaced. I'm sorry. I just, I really need your help. I just thought that if you could talk to you in person about it, that you might be, I mean, I sighed. Regardless of how intriguingly rounding her tight shirt was, she was still a kid. Call a spade a spade, Molly, I said. You figured if you could get me to come all the way down here, you'd have a chance to flutter your eyelashes and get me to do whatever it is you really want me to do. She glanced aside. It isn't like that. It's just like that. No, she began. I didn't want this to be a bad thing. You manipulated me. You took advantage of my friendship. How is that not a bad thing? My headache started to rise up again. Give me one reason I shouldn't turn and walk away right now. Because my friend is in trouble, she said. I can't help him, but you can. What friend? His name is Nelson. In jail? He didn't do it, she assured me. They never did. He's your age, I asked. Almost. I arched an eyebrow. Two years older, she amended. Then tell legal adult Nelson he should call a bail bondsman. We tried that. They can't get to him before tomorrow. Then tell him to bite the bullet and spend a night in the lockup, or else call his parents. I turned to go. Molly caught my wrist. He can't, she said, desperation in her voice. There's no one for him to call. He's an orphan, Harry. I stopped walking. Well, damn it. I'd been an orphan too. It hadn't been fun. I could tell you some stories, but I make it a person po personal policy to not review them often. The amount to a nightmare that started with my father's death. Of feeling acutely, perpetually, alone. Sure, there's a system in place to care for orphans, but it's far from perfect, and it is, after all, a system. It isn't a person looking out for you. It form, its forms and carbon copies and people with names you quickly forget. The lucky kids, more or less, randomly get tapped by foster parents who generally care. But for all the puppies at the pound who don't get chosen, Life turns into one big lesson on how to look out for yourself. Because 
There's no one in this world who cares enough to do it for you. It's a horrible feeling. I don't care to experience even the faded memory of it. But if I just hear the word orphan aloud, and that empty fear and quiet pain come rushing back from the darker corners of my mind. For a long time, I'd been stupid enough to assume that I could handle everything on my own. That's vanity, though. Nobody can handle everything by themselves. Sometimes you need someone's help, even if that help is only giving you a little of their time and attention, or bailing you out of jail. What's your friend Nelson in for? Reckless endangerment and aggravated assault? She took a breath and said, It's kind of a long story, but he's a sweet guy, Harry. There isn't a violent bone in his body. Which emphasized to me just how young Molly really was. There are violent bones in everyone's body, if you look deep enough. About 206 of them. What about your dad? He saves people all the time. Molly hesitated for a second. Her cheeks turned pink. Um, my parents don't like Nelson very much, especially my dad. Ah, I said. Nelson's that kind of friend. Things started adding up. I asked the loaded question. Why is it so important for him to get out tonight? Wait for it. Molly let go of my wrist. Because he might be in danger. The weird kind of danger. He needs your help. And there it was. Sometimes it's almost as though I'm psychic. Thank you for listening to Chapter 8 of the Dresden Files, Proven Guilty. Thank you guys very much for sticking with it through me and listening to me read it. I do want to thank you guys very, very much for that. And thank you guys very much for liking. Woo! That's too close. Liking, subscribing, and sharing my channel with others. That has helped it grow. Um, and I do want to thank you guys for this. You have a wonderful, wonderful time and a blessed day.